Hello and happy Sabbath to everyone. And um, what a wonderful privilege it is for us to be gathered together again to give God thanks and praises for his mercies and his grace. To every one of our friends that are listening from wherever you are, welcome to Bilston Seventh-day Adventist Church. We hope that today you will be truly blessed. Now let us begin our service by singing hymn number 21, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. scripture reading this morning is taken from Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18 and uh, verses 11 through to 14. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And the word of the Lord says this. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age. And Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child, since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Let's adopt a position of reverence as we seek the Lord in um, prayer. I'm going to, as part of the prayer, read um, Psalm 145. 
I say incorporate it in the prayer. I will extol you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving toward all he has made. The Lord upholds all those who fail the Lord oppose all those who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hands and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving toward all he has made. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever and Lord as we hear these words we want to thank you for bringing us all together today to fellowship in this form we know that there are others who are not able to join us for various reasons but Lord um, we think of them and we ask you to remember them and as we fellowship today we invite your presence and that the words of um, the preacher's mouth um, may um, echo the sentiments of um, your heart and um, your words, Lord. We thank you for all the things that um, you've given to us. But Lord, we beg and ask of your mercy as we think about um, things that are going on in the world, things that are... Um, making it difficult for some people to even um, feel happy, to be happy and to be contented. We pray for the sick, we pray for the um, bereaved families, we pray for absent members, we pray for those in various countries of the world who are suffering. Lord, we have heard that um, in India at this time, there are people who can't live because they haven't got the basic oxygen, you know, um, to be able to survive. And um, we think also of those victims of other disasters in St. Vincent. We've heard of um, victims of the um, volcano. But Lord, in all this, we pray that um, the spirit of love will transcend humans' hearts that they may do your will. We pray also for forthcoming events that's taking place at Bilson Church and we ask that you will be the pilot, that you will lead and you will guide and you will open the hearts of, um, um, of all of us, particularly the young people, that um, your words will also mean much and that their understanding will mean that um, they will be able to um, have a closer relationship with you. Lord, there are so many things that um, we could um, thank you for and ask you for, but these things that um, we have um, just thought about and all the other things that you think, if it's deserving, we ask you to grant them unto us as we fellowship. But we ask these mercies in your high and most holy name. Amen. Good morning, everyone.
morning. I see some people waving. How many children do we have today? Do we have any? <laughs> I, oh, I see some adult children and I... <laughs> Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Well, not, let me not keep you too long this morning. Our children's story is a, um, is a real story. It's a true life story that happened many years ago. And it's entitled Miracle in the Mist. If anyone's heard this story before, I apologize for you hearing it a second time, but I think it just reminds us how God is wonderful to us and how even before we call, he is always there with an answer to our prayer. So this story is about a brother and a sister. We'll call the brother Roger and we'll call the sister Pauline. Don't forget your life jacket, mom shouted after Roger as he grabbed his bag and bounded through the door. He looked at his sister and thought, why is it always me? Why is she always telling me to bring my things and doesn't tell Pauline to bring hers? He was really frustrated and he wondered, I just can't wait to be a teenager. Are you ready? said Mr. Jones, or, or Jim, I should say. His voice interrupted Roger's self pity. Yes, I'm ready, said Pauline. And Roger smiled and he allowed all of his frustrations just to disappear and fade away. It was a beautiful, sunny, wonderful day. And this was going to be his first boat ride. As they rode along on, the, on their little boat, Pauline chatted with Jim, who was their boat, their boatman, we'll call. And Roger just took in the scenery and, you know, dipped his hands in the water as, as they rode along. Feeling really upbeat and happy, he just wanted to wave cheerfully at the onlookers at the side, because as you, when you, has anyone ever been on a boat, a boat trip along a canal or, or anywhere? No? Yes? yes. You yes. can unmute yourself and talk to me. <laughs> yes, you have. Is that Monty? Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Well, as yes, yeah, so feeling quite up, feeling quite upbeat, um, Pauline Rogers sister she was happily chatting to to Jim and Roger was just you know as you sometimes when you're in a boat you just put your hand out on the water and you feel all the cool water in your fingers and it's normally quite lovely and beautiful scenery around so Roger was taking in all of this wonderful scenery and not really focusing on you know on what was happening he wanted to wave at the people on the side, but something in their faces made him hesitate. And he didn't wave back, he just kept quiet. Then all of a sudden, the engine of the boat began to roar as it hit a rock on the side banks and literally threw everything into total chaos. Jim, the driver, tried to control the boat with all of his might, but he just couldn't manage it. He looked to Pauline, Roger's sister, and said, get into that vest. He glanced at Roger, who, because he obeyed his mum, already had his life jacket. Then Jim began to wrestle with the boat. He just turning the wheel this way, trying to turn it that way. But try as he might, he couldn't keep the boat from flipping over when a huge wave swell struck the boat. Roger's head hit something hard. 
And for a moment, he was disorientated, didn't know where he was. A few seconds later, he caught himself and found himself being thrown around like a rag doll on the rocks. Has anyone ever been to been on a, a boat ride um, when you're going to some of the some of the islands? My family, I'll explain a little bit. My my family is my mother and my father are actually from St Vincent. My father, my mother is from St Vincent the mainland, and my father is from Bequay. Now the you could fly from St Vincent to Bequay, but it's um, most people don't everybody grabs a boat it's about a one hour passage and there are some boats that most of the the locals will tell you if you know take this other boat and not that one because that one rocks and rolls a lot on this on the sea <laughs> and you'll find many people don't find that very comfortable experience so i remember on one of my first trips going to st vincent from St. Vincent to Bequay, got on the boat. The boat is, a, it looks, a, you know, a big boat. It's not a cruise ship, but it, it's, it's a big enough boat that could carry, you know, a hundred people or so. And as you're sitting along the side and you're holding on to the railings, if the, if the water is choppy, you will be up and down and back and forward. And if you've had something to eat that morning or afternoon, you have to be very careful that it doesn't <laughs> decide to come back up again. But yeah, so that is a similar experience to what Roger had was, was, um, was, was going through. But this was far bigger water, as you will find out soon, and a far, far more dangerous place to be in. So after he felt like he was being tossed around by a rag, oops, my camera's disappearing. Tossed around by a rag doll, Roger couldn't see his sister anywhere. He looked for her, but he couldn't find her. All he knew was he was being dragged along a thundering cloud towards a thundering cloud of mist that was just a short way ahead. In the meantime, his sister was busy trying to hang on for grim death of, onto the overtoned, overturned boat, the railings along the, the boat, she was hanging on. But it hurt her hand so much that in the churning waters, she was forced to let go. Pauline could only hope that she could swim to shore. On the nearby banks, people could see what was happening. And one gentleman by the name of John, I believe, he could see her be trying to swim to shore because that was her only hope. He then ran along the side of the bank and shouted, swim to me, girl, swim to me. She couldn't see who her rescuer was, but she could hear his voice. And that was all the encouragement that she needed. And so she started to swim. And John grabbed her and he could only grab her by the thumb. He literally grabbed her by the thumb and tried to pull her to shore. Another tourist on the sea bank, on the bank could see what was happening and also ran along to help. And both of them, they managed to grab hold of her and grab her to safety. Once on dry, dry land, she told them about her brother and about Jim, their boat, their boat um, driver. And they said, wow, this is such a terrible situation. All we can do is pray. Because unbeknown to her, to, to Pauline, they were actually on Niagara River and were heading towards the falls. Literally, they had saved her 20 meters from the crest of the falls. So they prayed that Roger and Jim would somehow be rescued. 
Now I read, I will read to you the words of Roger. He said, he could not remember, well, actually, as he was going along the, in the, being tossed and turned, he could see on the side that people were, were there screaming at him. And his panic turned into anger because he's saying, well, why don't they help me? Why don't they help me? Then all of a sudden, everything just went dark, completely went black. Roger doesn't remember being catapulted into a cloud of mist on the horseshoe falls. He doesn't recall the 170 foot drop over half a million gallons of water that surged every second. He has no recollection of landing in the mist pool, miraculously missing every single one of those boulders that lay in wait beneath him. All he knew was when he awoke, he saw a ship in the, in the distance. This ship was a tour boat and the captain had seen him struggling in the water only because he had on his bright orange life jacket. It took a number of attempts to get Roger onto the boat, but he was finally rescued and pulled aboard. Many people spend their entire lifetime searching for God, but Roger Wardwood met him as a young boy in the miracle in the mist. There the Lord's mighty hand caught him and delivered him from danger. It was the spirit of God, he says, the spirit of the living God that saved our lives that day and gave us hope that one day me and my sister would get to know him. I just want to share with you, this is, this is a similar life jacket to one that Roger wore and that protected and saved him and his sister in the falls. And this is a picture of Niagara Falls. This was one that I took when I visited the Canadian side of Niagara Falls. Can you imagine dropping all the way down there to the bottom? Simply absolutely amazing that the Lord would save both Roger and his sister. And I believe, let me see if I can share with you a video of the same falls. Right. Can you vote? Can you still hear me? Yeah. All right. Can yes. You imagine. I don't. Just can, you know. You can see the banks with all the tourists. And it. And just imagine Roger coming all the way down here. And looking to see all of them watching and not being able to help him, as he tumbled straight down the falls, the Lord was able to rescue and to keep him. And it just reminds me of a Bible text that says before, that Lord says before the call, before you ask me for help, I am, have already answered and have prepared a way to rescue and keep you. And it's my prayer today that whenever, whatever situation we find ourselves in, it may not be as dramatic as being saved from the Niagara Falls, but we should always remember that God is there with us in every situation in life and that he can rescue us and keep us from harm. And as we begin each day and as we end each day, we should thank God for all that he's done for us 
and as children when we go to school when we go across the roads when we get on the bus you know we should always say a prayer to thank god for his protection and when we get home also to be grateful that we have made it home to our parents and those who love and care for us thank you very much for listening today and i wish you all a very pleasant and wonderful sabbath thank you bye kids thank you sister sonia very much for that children's story we all enjoyed it didn't we adults yes. <laughs> and i know the children did as well and so we'd like to thank you very much and uh, you know, we appreciate it. At this time, you know, we have got Bella Forrest. He's no stranger to us here in Bilston. And uh, he's uh, one of our faithful manservants of the Lord, who whenever he helps to come to us in Bilston, and now he has that special love for us in Bilston. So whenever I ask him, whenever I ask him, he never said no. He always comes. You know, Father, I should like to just welcome you one more time to Bilston. And uh, we pray that as you, you know, deliver God's message to us, it will get through to each and every one of us, even to the children. And therefore, before that, Bella Bickers, have we got a meditation now? Thank you. Bella Bickers will now do a meditation for us. And afterwards, our brother, brother um, Forrest Douglas will present to us God's message for, for us today. Thank you very much, Bella Bickers. The prophet Jeremiah says, Our Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. With faith in God, nothing is impossible. Over the years, the Family Harmony Choir have been singing this great message of hope. If God is for us, who can be against us?
Bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Everything is possible when you put your trust in God. Not some things, not maybe, but everything is possible. Mm -hmm. Man, it's so good to be here with you this morning. Um, Elder Herbert, I had prepared a special music. I had prepared a special item. And I had my guitar. I tuned it up this morning. I practiced the song. I drank water to clear my, my throat. And then, then we had a, another special music, but I was blessed by the song. Nothing is impossible. And I just want to say good morning, good afternoon to Myrtle. Myrtle, where are you? Just say good morning back to me because I'm talking to you, Myrtle. All right, that's all right. Just wave, sister. Where are you from, Myrtle? Where are you from? Press your button, unmute, your, unmute yourself, Myrtle. Do you know how to do that? Yes, yeah, so you have to press the screen and press the X over the microphone. Okay, so it's not working. Don't worry, Myrtle, don't worry. Myrtle, don't worry, don't worry. Somebody tell me where Myrtle is from. I know over Jamaica, I think. Where is she from? I think I know over Jamaica. Is that right, Angela? From Jamaica. Praise the Lord for Jamaica. Yes. And I love every last one of you, even if you're not from Jamaica. And so ha great to see you, Myrtle. My parents are from Jamaica, um, from Manchester and Kingston. And I just want to say a quick hello to Monty and Mika, Michaela, Suki. Donald Beverly, I'm not going to go through the whole list because there's too many of you, but you know, welcome to all of you this morning. All right. Now, from time to time, I may ask you a question because I'm not doing a monologue. It's a preaching service, but I'm having a dialogue. So from time to time, I will ask you questions and I will need a response. And I understand that you're a very talkative church, or at least you're talkative people. And don't say you're shy because I don't believe you. All right. And if you are shy, then I love you all the same. All right. So this sermon this morning is, is entitled, Is There Anything Too Hard for God? Um, and to tell the truth, the, the, the simple answer 
we have to say, well, actually, what would we say? Angela, what would you say? Okay, Elder Herbert, what would you say? Uh, yeah, after, on I means. would say, I would say no, nothing is impossible. Yes, yeah, nothing is, you would say no, I know Elder Herbert would say no, because Elder Herbert hold on to the shirt tail of Jesus, and wherever Jesus lead him, he follow. And um, uh, and I, I just want to say this, you know, Elder Herbert and myself go back many years. Elder Herbert has known me since I was 14 years old. I'm now 57. I think I'm 58 this year. I, I possibly could be. Um, but he's known me since I was 14 from down in Cardiff. Elder Clarence, and um, Herbert would say, he would say nothing is impossible to God. But you know, Monty, when you're in a situation where everything seems stacked against you, sometimes you have to scratch your head, even strong believers, even like Brother Herbert or the prophet Elijah, you scratch your head and you begin to wonder, but, but stop, but stop. But why am I going through this? Where is God? But I agree with Elder Herbert that with God, even if he's shh, everything is still possible. He may be just working out a plan that we know not of. And all he's asking us to be patient. I have a plan I'm working on. All right. So let's go to our scripture reading. Genesis chapter 18. But just before we do that, I just want to share with you one verse of, um, of the special the song that I was going to sing. You, you all know the hymn. You can't, you can't escape. I can't escape from my guitar. I love my guitar. Um, but the word this morning, I woke up, you know, I was tired. I was tired. I, I, I woke up and I said, Lord, um, let, me, let me spend some time with you. And then I, I began to sing a song. And the song that that came to me was awake my soul stretch every nerve awake my soul stretch every nerve and press with vigor on a heavenly race demand your zeal and an immortal crown a heavenly race demands your zeal and an immortal crown when i finish my sermon i'm going to play the last verse but a heavenly race demands our enthusiasm and sometimes we get sidetracked on this race, this heavenly race, where the Lord wants to give us an immortal crown of glory that doesn't fade away. None of us wear crowns on earth. Some of us may wear, may wear caps, flat hat, hat, turn back way, tie head wrap imaging. Some of us may wear caps, but in heaven we will have a crown of glory that does not fade away. It's a crown, some people may call it a wreath, you know, the, 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 the um, ancient um, Olympians in Greece, when they successfully completed a task, they were given a wreath, a wreath, put on their head, a symbol of victory. Man, I can't wait to get mine. I can't wait. All right, let's turn to our scripture text now, Genesis chapter 18. Go there with me in your Bibles. And... We're going to just ask the question before we go to the, the segment that we chose, which was verse 11 to 14. Before we go to that segment, I want to ask a question. I need you to unmute, um, or better still, I may just ask you directly by name. Is that a lot easier? So here's the question Abraham is the character in this story, this little story that we've got in Genesis 18. Abraham is the character. And um, he, we are introduced to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, here's the question. Genesis 12, 1. So keep your finger in 18. Genesis 18. But Genesis 12, verse 1 says this. The Lord 
appeared and had spoken to Abram and told him to get up, Abram, and leave your country where you're living right now. Go to a land I will tell you about, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I want to ask you, right? Why did Abram listen? Listen, listen, listen. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. All of a sudden, he hears God's voice and he just listens and obeys. So why did Abraham just listen and obey? So um, just have a few moments to think. Janet, you know, I want to ask you, uh, maybe Sonia, Janet and Imogen, between the three of you, um, please give me a response. I think because Abraham just God, he loved it and he obeyed him. And that's why he did it. He trusted and loved God. Mm -hmm. He trusted and loved God. So I, I'm going to, I want some evidence how we know that he trusted and loved God. Think about that image. So did Sonia and um, um, who was the other young lady? Janet. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, indeed. Okay, cool. Um, I think we have evidence that Abraham trusted a new God simply because of the relationship that um, he had with him um, before in terms of when he was um, he was asked to offer up his son Isaac. I'm not sure this is the sequence of what this, um, but he was asked, the Lord told him to take his son after the Lord had given him a promise that he would be the father of all nations. And here he was telling him to take his only son, who was the son of, of Sarah's laughter, because she was the son of she he was the son of her old age when she was 90 years old, I believe. She was either pregnant until she, and then she had the baby, you know, when she okay. to, Yeah, so because of because of that. And because of when Abraham had been asked to sacrifice, he made God, and God had said to him, "You to, to stop. You don't need to do this." Uh, and now I know that you fear me, that you respect mm -hmm. me, and okay. like, you know that Abraham. Sorry, Sonia, can you just repeat that last line? You, your receptionist went a little. Just that last line of what you said. Can you hear me better? Yes. So I said that simply because when Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son, his only son, and he obeyed the Lord and the Lord stopped him from doing that, the Lord himself said to Abraham, now I know that you love and you, fear and you respect me because you have not withheld anything from me, not even your only son. Okay. And relationship that Abraham developed with God, he could actually do what, you know, almost the impossible. Because who amongst us nowadays, if God had told us today to take our only child and go and, you know, send him off to be a missionary somewhere far, far away, we would never see him again. How many of us would, would actually do that? Sonia, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, so we know that that um, story that Sonia is referring to occurred one about Genesis 22. But um, so, so definitely Abraham um, developed that faith in God. But I, I'm asking the question, going back to chapter 12, when he heard God's voice, why did he just listen to God? Um, Angela, did you want to, Janet, did you want to share? Janet. Yeah. yeah, is it me? Yes, sister. <laughs> yes, I think um, because God saw that he would be an obedient person, he spoke to him and he wanted him to leave where he was, to get out of the, that environment, to go to a place where he could have speak to him and direct him what to do. And I okay. think so that he would be obedient to his word. So that's why he spoke to him. That's my okay. opinion. Sister Janet, let me ask you, thank you. The, the gentleman who sat next to you, that handsome gentleman right there, is that your husband? 
Yeah. How long have you how long have you been married? Um no, no, don't Janet, let me ask your husband. How long have you been married, sir? Yes. <laughs> 40 years. 40 um, years. Yes. 40 years. Which country are you all from? Jamaica. When did you come to the United Kingdom? I came here 62. Did you come without Janet? Were you married before you came? No, I met her in England. So we were married in England. Okay, so you met her right here in, in England and you got married in England. Janet, let me ask you a question. Why did you marry him? <laughs> because I loved him. <laughs> because you what? Love. <laughs> you loved him, all right. And, and uh, did you trust him when he said to you, I love you? Yeah. Well, yes. Well, well, yes, you sound uncertain. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have you grown to love him more during the years? Le yes. Wonderful. And that's our answer to why Abraham listened to God right there in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. He had grown to love God. And he had grown to trust God. And as Sonia said, and Imogen said, that developed over time. But um, here's a little bit of um, research I'm going to leave with you. Um, you can look at this later. But um, if you uh, go to, don't go there now, but Genesis chapter 11 uh, lists, um, sorry, Genesis chapter 10 lists the genealogy of um, uh, Abraham uh, of Noah's children. So chapter 10 will list uh, the genealogy of two of his children, uh, Ham and Jephthah. But when you get to chapter 11 of Genesis from verse 10, you have the genealogy of Shem. And Shem is uh, from the lineage, or, or Abraham is from the lineage of Shem. So the Jews were called Shemites or Shemites. But what I'd like you to do later is uh, find out how old Shem was when Abraham was born. And you'll be surprised. You can go, you can just go to chapter 11 of Genesis, uh, go from verse 10 onwards, and you just add, add the ages of when each child was born. And you know that Shem lived 300 years after the flood. You add those ages and you will discover how old Shem was when Abraham was born. So back in those days, um, the patriarchs didn't really have a uh, 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 written record. They had their intellects were immense, were powerful. We have a hundred billion brain cells. Their brain cells were, were a lot more uh, um, lively than ours, I would say, fresh from the hand of God relatively compared to where we are now. And they would memorize things uh, and they would pass information on to their children, grandchildren, and so forth. And I can just imagine Abraham or Abraham as a young man going down to Shem's house. Come on, come on, Neha. Come on, come on, Tira. Tira, come. come. And, and they're walking down to speak to Shem. Old man Shem begins to tell them about what life was like before the flood and begins to tell them about Noah, his father. And Noah begins to tell them about Enoch, who walked with God and was not. And I can imagine Abraham, Abraham's heart thrilling with the, that, that news. And so when God knocked on his door of his heart one day and said, Abraham, it is I, the same Lord who spoke to Noah, who made Adam. It is I, the same Lord who brought the flood. It is I, I want you to get up, leave your land. And if you go to the British Museum, you will see that Ur of the Chaldees was a rich, area full of gold a, a, a sophisticated culture and abram left that land of tranquility to go to somewhere that he didn't even know where he was going because he loved god and he had trusted god from the stories that were told him so parents grandparents continue telling the stories of the, the bible to our children and grandchildren continue telling them so that there will be a, 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 
a, a royal seed planted in their lives and in their minds. And even if they leave the Lord, the Lord will have a hook to plant in them to bring them back to him later in life. All right. Let me just um, um, ask the quick question, Brother Clarence, what time do we finish? Brother Monty, somebody talk to me. You, Brother Clarence, what time do we know? finish? Uh, we would normally finish around uh, that quarter past or something. Mm -hmm. like so that gives me that gives me nine minutes. All right. Uh, All nothing right. is impossible. <laughs> okay. Well, nothing is impossible with God, but you're dealing with Brother Forrest right here. Let's see if I can work with God. Here we go. Let me tell you now. Genesis chapter 18. The story begins. Abraham is right there in his tent door. It's boiling hot. And as he sat in the tent door, having had his lunch, he sat there. Sarah is in the back room. The wind, uh, the little bit of breeze is blowing the little flap of the tent door as it's just pinned back a little bit. And Abraham, old man Abraham, 99 years old, is there. And he's looking out in the haze of the sunlight. And all of a sudden, he sees across the way three individuals. One looks majestic. But there he is there in the heat of the day. What are they doing walking out there? The Bible says Abraham, Abraham, 99 years old, ran. Ran over to them. Please, he says, you have come to your servant. If I have found favor in your sight. But very strange. Because I would have thought Abraham was the one who, who, who was in the more favorable position. He had the tent shielding him from the sun heat. He had the food. He had uh, the wife who was tending to his needs. And here were three strangers walking in the, in the heat of the day. And Abraham says to them, if I have found favor in your sight, please stop and eat some food. The Bible says that Abraham said to his wife, darling, please cook up some food fast. And you know, it's interesting. The wife never said to him, I'm busy. I'm tired cooking. Up. She never said that. The wife ran and cooked up the food, but Abraham didn't leave her just to cook on his own. He helped her. The Bible says he ran to the flock and he chose a nice, we would call it a fatted calf, plump. Woman's good texture, good meat, said to the young man, prepare it. And then he ran back and he, there's a whole heap of running. You read it in chapter 18. Old man Abraham, 99, running all over the place. The Bible says um, he also bowed himself to the ground. So we pick up that he was flexible. 99, he bowed and he could also get up. Yeah. Many of us are aged and we can bow and we'll stay down for a while. But he got up and he was running. And so he prepares the food. And the Bible says that um, the three visitors stood under the tree in the shade. And they ate, they ate the mutton, and they ate the bread, and they, they drank the milk. Mm. You may be vegetarian, but give room to the meat eaters. Mm -hmm. I, okay, yes, it was, it was healthy meat, I understand. And I know we all need to do better. So if you can do better, do better. Uh, and make sure your diet is a diet that is going to give you longevity. Mm -hmm. So what strikes me is the word of one of these strangers. And they say to uh, Abraham, they say to Abraham, where is Sarah, your wife? Mm. <laughs> strangers, but they knew her name. And here's a little message. God knows our name. He knows where we come from. He knows our history. He knows our trajectory. He knows what has made us who we are up until this day. He knows our secrets. But he's a loving God. He knows our name. Where is Sarah, your wife? Well, she's in the tent. Sarah is in the tent, but she's listening. Her ears are up by the door, straining to hear everything. Because somehow Abraham realizes that these three individuals are not just ordinary humans. There's something divine about these individuals. And they say to, to Abraham, verse 10, 
I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now, hold on. Maybe the Lord, we know it was the Lord. You read it in the text. It was the Lord who was speaking. The Lord came down from heaven on a hot day to speak hope to a man who was near the grave, seemingly. God always shows up in our extremities to give us encouragement. He doesn't leave us alone in the heat of the day. And so he comes now and he says, Sarah's listening at the door. Uh, um, and uh, before he speaks, the narrator, the Genesis written by Moses, the narrator puts in some uh, some information, just in case we miss the point. All right, look at this. The narrator says in verse 11, now Abraham and Sarah were old. Mm -hmm. So Abraham name, Abraham's name means father of nations. He's not even got a son that he can call his legitimate own. Oh, yeah, he's got Ishmael, but that's not from Sarah. The father of nations and his wife were old. Uh, now, the Bible says they were well advanced in age. So let me explain a bit more here as we go along. And Sarah, the Bible said, had passed the age of childbearing. Does anyone know the age of childbearing? Do we have a nurse, a doctor, or just someone who likes biology, human biology? Anyone know the age of childbearing? I can't, I can't hear you as you, as you, I, I saw lips moving. So they say that the, the age for a woman, the average age, or uh, not the recommended age, but the average age is between 12 and 51, 12 and 51. Mm -hmm. Where, where the, the woman she has in her womb, she has what is called, I was going to say an eggplant, but it's not an eggplant, but it, it's, um, uh, an egg count, she has two million eggs. And she has two million eggs. And by the time the woman has turned 37, she is down to 25,000 eggs. And by the time she reaches 51, she has a thousand eggs left in her womb. But Sarah had no eggs and her womb had produced uh, zilch. And Sarah says in response, in her mind, as she laughs, she says, am I who am worn out like an old garment? That's what the phrase old means. Sarah says, after I have grown old, she means I am worn out like an old garment. How am I going to have children? And then the Lord answers and says, is there anything too hard for the Lord? This phrase, is there anything too hard? In the Hebrew, it's, it, it really says this. Is there anything too wonderful for the Lord? Is there anything too wonderful? And Isaiah 9 verse 6 says that his name, the Lord's name, will be called wonderful. So is there anything too wonderful for wonderful? Is there anything too impossible for the God who loves to do the impossible. So we have an equation. If you take the impossible and you add it to God, then you get endless possibilities and immense productivity. And um, I'm gonna end my sermon there because it, 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 we are right at the time when we should end if we take the impossible and add it to God, we get endless possibilities. Simply when God asked Abraham the question, is there anything too difficult for God, anything too impossible, anything too wonderful that he can't do? God was asking Abraham to recall past interventions, recall past blessings. And if Abraham had listened and gone back to stories he heard from Shem, if Abraham had gone back to his own experience in chapter 12, when 
uh, when um, he lied to the Pharaoh in Egypt because there was a famine and he said, my, my wife is really not my wife, is my sister because he was afraid he would be killed. If Abraham just remembered how God looked after him in trouble and plagued the Egyptians so they released his wife, Abraham would have realized that, hold on, impossibilities plus God leads to endless possibilities and great productivity. So brethren, all I want to leave with you today is that all things are possible with God. I almost feel like I'd love to do a part two, but I just want to say all things are possible with God. In conclusion, I just want to share the words of uh, the Apostle Paul in Romans uh, chapter 4. And Paul says this. Romans chapter 4 and verse 19, where he's talking about Abraham. And Abraham, not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred. And the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that he, God, had promised he was able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, listen, Paul says in conclusion that it wasn't written just for him. It was written for us, Paul says. And righteousness will also come to us as we believe in him, God, who raised up Jesus, who was delivered for our offenses, delivered to death for our offenses, but was raised up for our justification. So we have a great God. We have a God who deals in the impossibilities. We have a God who deals in the improbabilities. And I just want to say it doesn't matter how twisted our history may be, our lies may be, our doubt may be, no matter how confused we may be, or we can't even see the end from the beginning. We have a God who knows all, and with him there are no impossibilities. As we walk this Christian life, let us remember the words of this song. Blessed Saviour, introduced by Thee, our race have we begun, and crowned with victory at Your feet, we'll lay our trophies down, we'll lay our trophies down. Thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. You know, it is a message to help us. It's a message to help us understand that nothing is impossible for God, whatever it is that you and I are experiencing now, that God can do something about it. And he will do something about it if we exercise faith in him and believe that he is able to. So, Brother Forrest, thank you so much for that message of hope, for helping us to understand what God is able to do for each and every one of us. Thank you so much for that. At this time, we'll close our service with the use of him number 36. O oh, thou in whose presence my soul takes delight. Show.
you speak and eternity is filled with your voice and it re-echoes the praise of my Lord. Lord, we are so grateful for your voice of hope. We're so grateful that you're a positive father and that with you impossible things are possible. With you you give life to the dead mm. and hope to the hopeless. You forgive sins, you pardon guilt. You inspire and strengthen the feeble hearted and you give strength to those who are bowed down. So we are grateful this afternoon that you are still the same God who spoke life to a barren womb of Sarah, your child. And you, Lord, from her womb, brought forth many people. And in a sense, we too are children of Sarah and Abraham's because we have believed in you, Heavenly Father, who raised your son from the grave, who was delivered for our sins to death, but is raised up for our justification and our life and our freedom. So we're grateful this afternoon for the hope you have given to us. And help us, Father, to know that there is nothing impossible with you. And may we walk with you, talk to you, live with you until we meet you face to face. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. 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 And again, I'd like to thank both Faris and Sonia very much for being with us today and for their message of hope and assurances and one that um, generates confidence or for us to have more confidence in the Lord, that the Lord can do the impossible. So that whenever we're faced in a situation, we know that we are not alone, you know, and it, then, it takes me back to my favorite text, Jeremiah 33, verse 3. Call unto me, and I will answer you, and I will show you great and mighty things you don't know about. Mm -hmm. So as we go through this coming week, let us remember that 
God is the God of the impossible. And he can get us out of any problems. Thank you very much and have a blessed week, everyone. And don't forget, next Sabbath, we begin at 10.30. And our service will finish by quarter to 12. And our divine service and special service will begin at 12 o'clock. So thank you very much. Invite your relatives and friends to come along from next week. Thank you very much. God bless. Mm -hmm.